Or watched it. What? He's like, put <laughs> he's it up there and little, watch it. He's got like a little paint or like a little like blood pan. And he's cleaning with gas and kind of like, and, like, and then blow all the con- the passages clean. He holds it right above the bugs. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you can see all the gas just running. And then yeah, cleaning up the, 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 the filter too. With a cigarette in his mouth? Yeah, it's like, dude. <laughs> the filter is just dipping it in oil. All right, backfire and after fire. A backfire. Backfire is fire going backwards. That would be in the intake. I-N-T-A-K. Intake. So we have a fire going backwards through the carburetor, out the intake. It is like a burp. An after fire is fire after the cylinder. Fire after the cylinder in the exhaust. That is also very bad because it will blow up the exhaust. We hear it all the time out at the airport, especially fuel injected engines. People prime it, prime it, prime it, prime it. They have fuel running into the cylinders. One cylinder, maybe it overlap, or, or um, then fuel's going in the intake, out the exhaust, filling up, puddling inside of the uh, exhaust system. They hit the key, spark, ignites that in there, and you hear boom out of the exhaust. And that would be what? Backfire or after fire? After, after fire. After Everyone fire. Calls that huh? Everyone always calls that like a backfire. Everyone calls it a backfire. But it's not. All right. Um, let's see if you remember this. Uh, well, I'm just going to write it in case that was not good. What's going on here? I didn't touch it. Oh, maybe you should have. There it is. We good? Yep. I felt something under my foot. Uh, a mixture slightly, a mixture slightly richer uh, we'll say 25 to 50 ROP. What does ROP mean? Rich at peak what? EGT. Okay. Mixture slightly richer, rich at peak, um, burns the fastest. We seen a problem with that 25 to 50 degrees Richard Peak. Uh, and then the flame front is gonna slow down on either side of that. On either side, I think this is kind of repeating myself. Um, that is why we use excessively rich mixture at very high power settings. Right? That is why that is why we use excessively rich mixtures at very high power settings. I want to say at high power setting, I think my airplane runs about 300 degrees rich a peak, 300, 350. It's quite a bit. Uh, very, very And why do we do that? To slow combustion and put the peak pressure point far enough are enough um, after top dead center to prevent prevent what detonation. detonation and keep CHTs down to reasonable levels.
Uh, I mentioned this yesterday, so I'll say it again. There was a there's a Q and A question. What causes backfire? And it is a lean mixture is the answer. It's something about I forget a lean mixture would cause. Uh, the brain burns all the way through all four strokes. And yeah. Uh, so, so it's saying playing front slows down on either side. Why is it, why is it doing that again? Or because when you go either rich or lean, mm -hmm. it slows down the burn. Okay. So you have that like best power right there, which is, we'll call it best power, or 25 to 50 degrees rich a peak is right where it's going to be the flame front's the fastest. If I enrich it, the flame front slows down. If I lean it, the flame, flame front slows down. But if I lean it at a high power setting, then I'm losing some of the fuel for cooling, and then the cylinders get hotter. So you gotta be careful with that. All right, um, so yeah, it's not likely that the mixture is so lean or so rich it will burn from 30 degrees before top dead center through power and most of the exhaust to the point where intake valve opens. However, during valve overlap, manifold pressure is so low it could pull hot exhaust back into the manifold. Follow that? Hot gas, the, the manifold pressure is so low that it could pull hot exhaust gas back into the intake manifold and light off the fuel air mixture coming this way. So that's how we could get. Oh, so. Wait, say, it, say it again. Okay, so how could we how could we get? I oh, know my notes are kind of weird here. How could we get a backfire? Backfire. Backfire. Um. At at uh, let's see. At idle, manifold pressure is so low that it can pull hot exhaust into the intake at valve overlap. which lights off the incoming fuel air mixture. How's that? So you, would you just, if you like opened up, then when you do the, if you opened up the, if you opened up, <clears throat> if you close the throttle abruptly? Yep. No, so right there, you're at idle, you're okay? Idle. So that means your manifold, the engine, the pistons are sucking real hard against the plate, which means that whole tube from the throttle plate to the cylinders is under a major vacuum. So it's really low pressure, all right? And so we got this low pressure. We have air and fuel kind of headed up towards the cylinders. Remember, there's several cylinders. And this one over here goes into valve overlap. All right, this one over here is sucking real hard. And this one over here is sucking. This one goes into valve overlap. And both valves open for a second. Well. We got this tube under a lot of vacuum and outside air is not, so it'd be real easy for air to come up through the exhaust into the cylinder, through those two valves and back in and satisfy that, but it's super hot air. So that super hot air gets in that manifold right there and causes the fuel air in there to light off, which boosh. So you're you gonna be more likely to have a backfire if you were like moved super low in here? Yeah, low manifold pressure at idle is and when you're gonna get it. And at high pressure and heavy pressure? Um, I suppose, yeah. What if the engine only had the valve Yeah. It probably wouldn't. So that would happen in our O290? I kind of don't think so. If this is what's causing it, then no, it's probably not going to happen. What would cause it in the O290, and you will experience it, is the mistiming of the magneto. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Your magneto goes off on the intake stroke, and the valve is open, and it lights off everything in. <laughs> so <laughs> that, is pro that will happen. In the next eight weeks. <laughs> so, what, why would you have? Why would that happen? Why would you have such low pressure in the intake manifold? You do by the nature of idle, because the throttle plate is closed and the piston is pulling back on it, and no air can get through. Very little air gets past the throttle plate. Right. So that means your manifold pressure is then under a tremendous vacuum. Right. So that would just be like, well, then you're saying that it's a kind of sounds like you know, you're saying a backfire is just a regular thing, but it's not. It's a bad thing. I know it's a bad thing. So 
but you know our engines don't just backfire every time we start them. No, they don't. So how what, yeah, what is cause the backfire? That something's got to be a problem, right? Yeah. You got to have a problem. What is the problem that's causing it? It is too low a pressure. No, it's not too low a pressure because it's the normal pressure you're having. So I understand your question. Now I'm trying to think of the answer to that. So how come every um, every engine out there that has valve overlap, how come it doesn't backfire? Um, I think it also comes into play when you have a very lean mixture. Because I have noticed that. Well, I've noticed a correlation. So, so lean mixture. Uh, I don't like that one either. The answer that the Q&A gives you is the mixture is so lean that it does it. It does happen in a lean mixture. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that one. Yeah, yeah. What I actually have here is see, um, let's see. It's not likely that the mixture is so lean or so rich it will burn from 30 degrees before top dender center through power stroke and most of exhaust to the point where the intake valve opens. That's excessive. However, during valve overlap, the manifold pressure is so low that it could pull hot exhaust back into the manifold and light off the fuel air mixture. In old radials, this was more likely if the intake fuel air mixture was lean. So if it was lean, it was likely to happen. But typically, it's so rich that it, it, it won't. So, so I'm asking, if you have something that's backfiring? Too lean. Yeah, you're just saying, well, you just really, you just, just don't, you just Rich in it, rich in a little bit. Just yeah. And we'll do that with the uh, ground power unit. We get it so lean, it'll start backfiring a lot. Well, we don't, if you have an air cleaner and stuff, it's not good for it. It cleans them off, it blows the dirt out. <laughs> All right, so after fire, I already talked about after fire. After fire can be uh, caused by a mixture that's so rich that raw fuel gets into the hot exhaust. So, caused by a mixture so rich that raw fuel, or fuel, I don't know what raw fuel is, fuel gets into exhaust. All right, uh, that's enough of that. It throws. It sounds to me like if it was if the flame front gets super clo far close when you're super lean, then maybe it's just igniting before it's even compressing. I don't know. I'm just trying to get. I'm just trying to see that. You're saying you don't, I don't think it goes all the way around. I don't right? have a good answer for you on what it. I want to know. I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't have the answer. I'm just making up crap now. All right. I want to change what I'm doing here. And let's talk about carburetors now. And I don't know I teach this different every year. I, I, what I don't like doing teaching with carburetors is doing a bullet point by bullet point, line by line. Although you need to know this information, I think things just start to get lost in the weeds. So um, I know in the past, kind of what I've done is I've gone through all the different systems and how they work. But I want to bring it all together, just kind of say. Let's go through a carburetor and then, then talk about how things work. If that's okay with you. If it's not, you can wait outside. I'm okay with that. I'll just <laughs> All right. So the first carburetor I, that you should have received is a Stromberg, although you don't have to. If we ran out of Strombergs, Kelly would have handed out uh, marble shovelers. But this is the Stromberg carburetor right there. Did uh, you guys get Stromberg carburetors? Mm -hmm. All right. So... First thing you need to know about the Stromberg carburetor is the parts for this thing are stupid expensive and very, very hard to find. So don't break it. Don't strip it out. You'll be responsible for this carburetor. If you break it, you're going to fix it. And I don't know how you're going to fix it, but be gentle with it. I believe the instructions are pretty clear to only torque things to about half their value because they're old and they snap. And so don't do that. So the Stromberg carburetor is found on small engines. Uh, a65s, 
C85s, up to C85s, this particular one. And then you would see them on older radial engines. They make a version of this that's just four times the size of that. They're huge. I have a whole bunch of them in the back room. If you give, her, give one out for a Christmas present or something. But uh, so Stromberg is, is uh, a pretty ubiquitous carburetor in the older, older world. Anything newer is going to get the Marvel Shebler. So we'll talk about the Marvel Shebler next. In some ways, the Stromberg's a little more difficult to understand. Um, in other ways, it's not. So, you know, it's like six one way, half a dozen the other, which way I want to talk about. The one thing I do love about the Stromberg is the fact that it has a fantastic colored drawing that makes a lot of sense. So we can start with that. Let's see. Actually, let's do this. Now let's take the whole thing. There we go. Now I can do whatever I want to with it. Yay. Okay. So first thing I want you to understand with this carburetor is the way it's drawn is drawn one way and then it's kind of sideways to get this over here. There you go. To get this over here. So I'm not going to write a bunch of notes right now. If you want to write notes, that's great. I'll try and circle back around and catch up with notes. But with any carburetor system, and I want to say every system we're going to talk about, whether it's the float carburetor, pressure carburetor, fuel injection. There's always going to be two systems in every carburetor, two basic systems. So you're going to have what we call an idle circuit, and we'll call the other one the off idle or not idle. So idle and not idle. And the reason why you're always going to have these two circuits is because carburetors just, and all these things just don't work. It's two functions of the engine. At idle speeds, there's very little air moving through the fuel device. And so because there's such little air flowing through it, nothing works right. So I have to come up with another system uh, with a way to make it work at, with low, uh, a low amount of airflow. Then once the air starts flowing much faster, then we have to have another system because that system over there was designed for very low airflow and we need one for high airflow. So every carburetor fuel injection system is going to have two circuits. Circuits are idle, idle and off idle. All right, and of course the function of a carburetor or all of these fuel systems is to, with the exception of one of them, is to measure the quantity of air going into the engine and provide the appropriate amount of fuel for that engine speed. So it's got to measure the air, add the fuel, and then go. So there's got to be something in there that's measuring the air or, or a means to deal with more air versus little air. Otherwise, it's not going to run correctly. And of course, we want it to run appropriately through the whole range of, of engine speeds. Now, unlike a car, so even old-timey cars, you guys, anybody have a car with a carburetor on it? Old Mustang or something like that? What, what do you mean? We got an old duster. Yeah, there you go. See, you got a carburetor, right? Okay, so even going back there, cars can handle um, mashing the throttle, right? Revving the engine up high. Airplanes can't. Right? They're not, we're not supposed to do that. So it's not unusual to have a carburetor that would not handle something like that. If you mash the throttle forward, it's just going to stumble and, and kind of want to die. Uh, it's not ideal because there are times where, you know, you're coming in for a landing and a deer or dog or something runs across the runway and you got to hit the throttle and you, you want to do it nice and even and gentle, but, you know, we're humans. We're going to smash it forward. They weren't designed for it, but there's usually some mechanism that will allow it. You just shouldn't do it. So, all right, so we have a carburetor. It's got to measure the fuel, measure the air, and add the appropriate amount of fuel. So the way the Stromberg works, and a lot of them work, is the main measuring device, we're going to talk about the off-idle circuit right now, is, which is funny, you can see the dot, but on the recording, you cannot see the dot, which is something that was really weird. If I go like that, you can see it, and then it goes away. Isn't that weird? So something I had to discover while I was doing the videos the other day. Are you doing that on the video, like doing the circle thing? Well, when I made one, the first video I did and I had the dot like that where you can see it, 
and I did all the talking, I'll be like, well, this thing right here and this over here. And then when I rendered the video, the dot wasn't anywhere. So I had to superimpose the circles as I was talking about it. And then the next few videos, I realized that if I want you to see the dot on the video, I literally have to push down on this and do that. So anyway. Okay, so the thing that does the measuring is always going to be the Venturi. So the Venturi is going to measure the air coming in. We have a throttle valve, which just as the name implies, is the throttle. It's, it's what controls the speed of the engine. So if we think about what is controlling the speed of the engine, it's letting the air in. I don't even think about it as the fuel. Fuel's like secondary. If I want the engine to speed up, open this up and let in more air. Carburetor will do its thing and bring the fuel along with it, but the main thing is I'm gonna bring in air. So right now this is shown in the wide open throttle, W-O-T, wide open throttle. If it were an idle, it would be like this right here. But it's not right now, it's a wide open throttle. So wide open throttle, we have the Venturi is measuring the air. Well, what is the Venturi doing? Bernoulli's principle means what? I have a velocity increase, which causes a decrease. So right in this area right here, we have a vacuum low pressure a vacuum and the wider open this throttle gets the more air is going to come through the more of a vacuum we get here well what did we stick right in the middle of that vacuum a fuel nozzle okay so for the basic air passage going into the engine is quite simple it comes from the air filter up through here and off into the engine not real complicated it saw the venturi Went past the throttle valve, high throttle valve, and then it went off into the engine. And that's just all there was to it for the most part right there. But the fuel system, a little more complicated, but not complicated. First thing is fuel is going to come in through the fuel inlet and go across some sort of screen. When do we check that screen? every 100 hours or annual if you don't know just default to that go well at least every annual or every 100 hours do not say every overhaul <laughs> because by the book that would mean every 12 years or about every 2400 hours in reality it would mean every 30 years or <laughs> or 2000 hours so no do you want to check the screen how often Every, uh, okay, that's the standard answer for everything we're going to work on for the most part. Okay. So, fuel comes up through here, and the first thing it's going to see is a needle and seat and uh, a float. And this is toilet bowl technology. You want to see what, excuse me, you want to see what this looks like? Just go in the bathroom, pull the tank off, the, the lid off the back, and there you go. It's basically the same technology. We need the fuel to be at a certain level. The level the fuel is at is a critical level. It must be just below the outlet of the main discharge nozzle. We have main discharge nozzle right there. You can see it, this, that's this thing right here, the main discharge nozzle. So the fuel has to be just below that. Oh, well, what if it's above it? Well, then it continues to drip out nonstop. So that would be bad. If it's too low, then what happens? Well, you need a lot more vacuum in here to make the fuel go. So now what you're telling the Venturi to do is all off. You're saying, well, at a certain percent of a certain number of vacuum, we need X number of fuel. Well, you're going to get a lot less fuel. So the engine is, if it's low, you're going to run lean. If I make it too high, not only will it drip out when the engine's not running, but once the engine runs, it will be running rich. rich. So the fuel level <coughs> dictates lean and rich. So the manual is going to dictate a very specific fuel level. Now, the way it's measured in a Stromberg, this is the parting flange right here. So everything above the line right there, you take off. You actually can put this on a bench and you can put a depth micrometer across here and use the pin to go down and measure it. I'm gonna, I'll show you that um, in the shop at some point, probably Monday, how to measure 
the, uh, the float level. Well, I just kind of told you. So you take the top off and you put it on our float bench, our bench, and you hook up the hoses and you open up the fuel and the fuel is going to come in and the float is going to uh, raise up. And as the float raises up, it's going to push this needle down. And as that needle comes down, it is going to take a seat right there and block off all the fuel. And then as the fuel goes out, then the float level starts to come down. The float goes down, opening this up, allowing more fuel to come in. So to check the float level on this particular carburetor, you take the top off, hook up the hose, let gravity come, uh, fuel pressure come in. Uh, the float will raise up until this closes, giving you the fuel level. Then you take a depth micrometer, put it across the parting flange, and you will screw it down. And it's kind of cool. Watch it when, you, when you're watching it. And so you have this fuel level in there. And you're going to bring down your depth micrometer. And you're going to bring it down and bring it down and bring it down. And all of a sudden, boosh, the fuel just jumps up on it. Meniscus. Surface tension, meniscus. It's like, I'm not close, I'm not close. Whoa! It's like, now it's halfway up the stupid thing. Well, that was it. It just touched it and the fuel went up it. So right there, you stop, you, you, you take it off, and you measure the reading of how far down you went, and that's how you get the uh, float level. Now, interestingly enough, we have to think about this just a little bit. If I wanted to change the float level, let's say the float level is too low. I'll write this here. Too low. So I remember what I said. Too low. Too low. It's too low. Float level is too low, which means that it is right here, right? How could I increase that float level? I need it to shut off earlier or later? Later. So if it's too low, it's got to shut off later. So do you do that by adjusting the height of the seat? The height of the seat. You can move that up or down. Do I want to make that seat go up or down? So if I bring the seat down, seat down equals fuel up. It's backwards. And the opposite is true. If um, the fuel level was too high, then I need to shut the fuel off sooner. sooner so I would raise the seat up. So seat up equals fuel down. Fuel down. All right, so fuel comes in and it sits in the fuel bowl. Now we know that it's critical where that fuel level is because if it's too high, it's going to be dripping out, dripping out. So dripping out and too rich. And if it's too low, too, too lean. All right, uh, a not fun thing about the Stromberg carburetors is that these needle and seats leak. So if you have one, it leaks. So you, you're checking the fuel level, and it's going to go to right here. And then a few minutes later, it's going to be here, and a few minutes later here, and an hour later, it's going to be there, and then two hours later, it's coming out of here. You guys probably turn your fuel off every time you fly Actually, the plane? Actually, ours doesn't leak. It's, it's rare. I know Kit said the same thing. Yeah. I know. Probably because you have the wrong needle and seat. They had several different versions. They had the rubber ones, which were really good until the fuel eats them up. There's the metal ones, which if you lap them in, kind of work. And there's the plastic ones I think you're supposed to get rid of. But anyway. All right, so fuel is in the fuel bowl. The next thing it's going to come to is going to be the main metering jet. All right, the main metering jet is the item that is going to limit the amount, the maximum amount of fuel that goes out of the carburetor at its wide open throttle setting. It can't meter fuel at both idle, mid range, high. It's just it's one size. So they figure out how big this should be for maximum RPM. And so that is the main limiting thing at max RPM. Looks so like that is a little it's not, it's just a restriction. It's just, a restriction. It's just a, yeah. Because, and you can tell because there's nothing else attached to it. There's no, what, low pressure would do nothing for you. And fuel is not moving very fast through this. 
So fuel comes through here, and you now it's changed color, so now it's called metered fuel because it's gone through the metering jet, where it's now going to enter into the fuel nozzle. All right, so a couple things happening with the fuel nozzle. One, we need to emulsify the fuel. That is to mix in some air with it. When you mix in the air with it, it does a couple of things. And in your book, there's a little, I don't, I don't think I put it in this, let me see, my slides. There's a person with a little straw sucking up on, I keep it. No, every year I go, oh, I should put that in there, but I don't. Um, <coughs> You know, the video, the Stromberg video said you have to lap the needle and see. Yeah, he did in the video. He did it. With this was said, lapping it in. Yeah, yeah, yeah a little lapping compound, the metal ones. Lapping? Yours doesn't, apparently, so well, it's fine. Well, I, I haven't taken <laughs> it apart, so it's in there for like a week until you do. The metal seat? Well, yeah, you can't lap the rubber one. That would be impressive. Yeah, don't, don't do that. Um, yeah, but there's a... Uh, an example in your book where somebody has a straw and they're sucking through the straw but it's got a secondary one that comes out and it's got a little hole drilled in it and the fact that you allow air to come in at this point makes it a little easier for the uh, fuel to be drawn out all right so so the mixing with air emulsifies the fuel and helps to get the get the fuel out oh well, where does the air come from well the air comes from right here main air bleed so air is just going to come in through the throat of this carburetor is kind of like this on both sides. And I'm not sure I think it's actually more like this. And this is on that side of the Venturi. So air just comes up through this channel. It has to do a turnaround and go back down this way, which I think is kind of cool because if you had a piece of dirt or something, right, it would hit that and maybe fall back down. But air is going to come in through here through the uh, main air bleed, which is just another little tiny orifice to limit the amount of air. Because if you had too much air, then too much air gets in here and then you're going to run lean. And if you don't have enough, enough air, then you're going to get big old globules of fuel coming out and that's not going to be good either. So air comes in through here and there's a bunch of holes where the air enters into here, which emulsifies the fuel and goes out. So it's helping atomize. Atomizing the fuel. And there's nothing more to it. That is the whole thing. So now you know how a carburetor works. Any questions? Yeah, how's the, how's the mixture? How, uh, yeah, over it Nobody really knows. That's <laughs> you find out on part two. Not even the engineers? Nope. It just the spaceman that made it and left it behind never told us how it worked. All right. That's how the off idle system works. All right, and so the more you open the throttle valve, more air you get, the more air you get, the more suction you get here, the more suction you get, the more fuel you get out. That's just that simple. All right, but now let's look at the idle circuit. So the idle circuit works on the same principle, except now the throttle plate is closed and the venturis are useless because this space right here is very, very small. All right, you could barely get a piece of paper through there. But what's happening on top of the carburetor is the engine is operating, right? And so the piston is coming back on the intake stroke and it wants air, wants to fill up that whole cylinder. But it can't because that cylinder is coming back and we've got it pretty much blocked off right here. So that means everything up here is going to be under a vacuum. So we have a pretty significant vacuum right up here. But we're going to use that vacuum just to draw the fuel out. Well, it's the same carburetor just drawn a little sideways. So what happens is fuel comes through the fuel in it across the strainer, comes into here, fills up the float bowl, comes out down the main metering jet just like it did before. It's going to come up through here into this space right here, fill up this whole nozzle with fuel, and now we're just going to turn the carburetor sideways. So now the carburetor sideways, and we're just looking at it sideways. So fuel came into right here, filled up the whole nozzle, right? Okay, there's a passage just off to the side where fuel is allowed to come up through here. And this tube right here unscrews. It's like one big tube. You'll see it sticking out. Just unscrew it, pop it out. And it's got a 
idle metering jet, a little tiny opening right there. So the fuel comes out, goes through that idle metering jet, which meters how much fuel, the maximum amount of fuel that can come through here while it's at idle. We can see that there's little bubbles, so we're going to talk about that in a minute. And it comes up to here, and it has two passageways out. One, two. Sometimes they'll have three. But in this case, we've got one hole there and one hole there. And so because there's so much suction up here, it's drawing fuel out of these two passageways. Why is there two? Well, because one wouldn't be enough, and three would be too many. And so this one is unrestricted. There's nothing we can do about it. But this one right here has this nice little screw there. So we can adjust it a little bit if we want to. We can screw it in we, and, and cut off some of the fuel. Or we can open it up and let more fuel go out. So it's an adjustment that we as mechanics get to mess with. It's called the idle, idle mixture. mixture adjustment. And it only works at idle. idle. All right. So we also have to get some air in here. And we're going to get that from behind the Venturi. There's just a little opening behind the Venturi, a little hole drilled in where the, and notice that this hole is above the fuel level. Otherwise, when it's off, this is all solid red all the way up to here. All right, because fuel is going to seek its level through the whole carburetor. Just like it did right here. Why is it right there? Well, because there's no suction and fuel is going to find its own level, right? So everything is all the way across is all going to be dark red. And then when we start it up, we're going to get fuel out of the idle mixture and out. Then when we transition from full idle to a little less idle, a little less idle, then, why is that drawn weird? It's not. All right. This hole right here is going to become um, under less of the blue pressure and more of the yellow pressure. So as we start to open this up, this then becomes less <coughs> influenced by the blue. And so a little less is going to start flowing out. And a little more will start coming out of here. And so these will transition slowly to letting it go out of here. So it's not all or nothing. It's like one second you're these two and the next second you're that. What happens is it transitions between the two. So, and if there was a third nozzle, that's what I was thinking. If you're like this, I like it if it's drawn this way better. So if we're like this, that's what I want to say, then something else shows up. So if it was like this, then fuel is going to come out of here and not here. Got it? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're going to run just off this one. Then as this line right here opens up and comes down a little bit more, it starts exposing the next hole. And now we get twice as much fuel. And if there was a third hole, and it went down and uncovered, maniacs, covered the third hole, then we get three jets coming out. And then it would open a little bit more, and then we'd start getting fuel out of here and start weaning it off of that. Follow that? Then, if we were at idle, and we were to suddenly open the throttle rapidly, we're going to let a Quite a bit of air come in all of a sudden. It's like, boom, got all this air. Well, wait a minute. This is a little slow to react, and we got to switch right here, and we got to do all this stuff. Well, this is actually called an accelerating well system. Because this whole thing is full of fuel and there's extra pockets right there, it allows a rich mixture to come out and meet that fuel. So we had a sudden influx of air. We get a sudden influx of fuel, and then things will settle into where it's supposed to be. So... This does have an accelerating system. It's called an accelerating well. But Evan, what? Yeah. So the gas doesn't come out of the accelerating well to go through the idle. The, the gas will stay in the accelerating well. Mm -hmm. What it, the accelerating well really is just 
this right here has been full of gas because there's no suction. And since this is all full of gas, when you do get a suction, the, all this gas has to come out and then the air starts, oh, it's full of gas here too. All this is full of gas. And so when you then open up the throttle, it starts to go, the fuel in here works its way out as air pushes it in. And then you start to get that air mixture. So at, it's very rich at first. So it's like temporarily, enriched temporarily enriched. Just to make up for the, the lag. Yeah. It's probably less atomized too. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. But Evan wants to know how the mixture control works. I want to know how it works with when you don't have a mixture control. Okay. So this particular carburetor, because it was put on smaller aircraft that tended to not go to higher altitudes, like Cubs and stuff like that, it was an option to put in a... The carburetor has the mechanism on top. It has the mixture control on top. Right here, it's bolted on there, but it's safety wired to the full rich position. And the knob in the cockpit to operate it was an option. What? Yeah. So I could stick it on my airplane? Yeah, you should have the stuff on top. It's just safety wired to rich. Okay. okay. But this is the complicated thing about this carburetor is understanding how the mixture control works. And I think where it gets its bad reputation, one, they tend to leak a little bit, which just turn the fuel off when you're not using it, and who cares? The other one is people don't understand the mixture control. And to a large part, they're not capable of understanding it, as I've come to experience. And it's the complicated part of this carburetor, but it's really not complicated. On top of the fuel bowl, we have air pressure. Right? It's yellow. And I don't think they meant to change the color from light yellow to dark yellow. It's just supposed to be yellow, right? So, you know, like you can see right here, it's dark, dark yellow here. It should be dark yeah, yellow. Yeah, like two white colors and two blue colors. It's like on the, on the right of key. Oh, that's like a blue and that's a white. So, all right. So just imagine it's all dark yellow, right? So don't let the light, light throw you off there. It's all dark yellow. We have to have pressure on top of the float chamber. And that pressure is equal to the outside pressure. And that's what keeps things equal. If I added shop air to right here, first of all, I damage the. <laughs> I would do some major damage. Um, what would happen if I if I increase the pressure over here with with uh, shop air or something? It wouldn't even matter if the carburetor was running. This high pressure would force the fuel out and blow it out of here. The carburetor running or not, which tells you that the pressure here has a huge effect on what happens here. So if the pressure on top of the fuel is more than the pressure here, it's gonna blow the fuel out. And, yeah, or just blown it out. If the pressure here is, well, and that's what we want actually, when the carburetor's running, this becomes a low pressure area, right? This becomes a high pressure area and it pushes it out. We say sucks it out, but it's same. If the pressure here is equal to the pressure here, how much fuel comes out? Nothing. Nothing. So by varying the pressure here, we can affect how much fuel comes out here. So we're running the carburetor. It's wide open. We have a certain pressure right here. Everything's running great. And I want a little bit less fuel to come out. What could I do to get a little bit less fuel to come out? Lower the pressure right here. If I want a little bit more fuel to come out, what can I do? Increase the pressure, Increase the pressure here. So by varying the pressure there, we just take care of uh, the mixture. So how does it work? Well, we have two passageways coming up. This passageway right here, which is blue, which is vacuum. This one right here is ambient or pressure compared to here. So the two of these come up here to a mixing chamber and I can mix it. Well in this particular position it is shown right now drawn in the full rich position which means that this tube right here is really wide and this one right here is very small. small. All right so we have a small suction right there. Follow? 
but we've got a lot of available air in here. So where does the air this suction want come from? Well, mostly it comes from right here and a little bit goes that way. Follow? Yep. Right. So for the most part, any suction that comes out this way is stealing a little bit right there. And you know what? It doesn't even notice because this satisfies more than enough need going over that way. And so you got a little bit, got robbed that way. Who cares? So this is running in full rich or full lean? Full rich. Full rich because this is doing absolutely nothing. Stealing a little bit, but who cares? But then when we lean it out, so now we're lean up here. Now what did we do to the passageway? Right, so now this is sucking back on this and it's only getting a little bit of yellow air in here. So on the full rich position, we're sucking all the air out. So if we're sucking all the air out and this right here is equal to this right here, how much fuel comes out? If this right here and this right here are equal to that right there, how much fuel comes out? Yeah, which is saying, I should have done it this way. If this is equal to this, how much fuel comes out? Zero. Nothing. Just like if this is all yellow and this is all yellow, how much fuel comes out? No. None. If this is all blue and this is all blue, how much comes out? No. None. None. Well, what's a little bit of blue and a little bit of green? I don't know, yellow is green? <laughs> so anyway, so as we uh, add suction to the top of the float chamber, we start leaning out the carburetor. So it's called a back suction mixture control. So is there, with, when they just, they don't have that option like, like ours? It's there, you just there. wired, wired rich. But uh, you just, you just, how you fly, I mean, it's, it's like, it doesn't seem like I ever have a problem. You don't, you just run rich. You might get a little more power. You probably don't fly your plane very high, do you? You got a 10 in that thing? Well, if you're going to 10, I'd probably run much nicer if you fired this up. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know that. I didn't know you're not going to save money. This plane burns like four gallons an hour. It's like... <laughs> no, no, it's four, it's four and a half. <laughs> it, evapor it evaporates fuel faster than it burns it. <laughs> All right, so here's where... Now this gets its bad reputation. This system works really, really well. It really does. People come, ah, it doesn't work. Yeah, it works fantastic. On all of the other carburetors and fuel injection, and every other system with the exception of this one, you shut the engine off with the mixture control. When you want to shut the engine off, you reach over, you pull the mixture all the way back, you shut off the fuel, the engine dies, turn off the key, turn off the mags, and you're done. This system won't work. If you're in idle and you pull back the mixture on this system and you wait for it to die, it eventually will. Because eventually the fuel out of the tanks will be exhausted. It'll burn it all up. You'll run the aircraft dry and then it will die. So, but why doesn't it work? Because right there is the inlet for the yellow air. Right there above the venturi is where the suction is. Right there above the venturi is the suction line. How much suction is being provided at idle right there? So at idle, this is yellow and this is yellow. So you have yellow and yellow. You can move this knob on the top all day long and you will get yellow and yellow and yellow because the suction comes from right there. So why doesn't it work at idle? Because there is no there is no suction available to the top of it. It's all ambient. It's actually a positive. All the other ones work because it's actually a positive shutoff valve. It doesn't use air pressure. It uses a valve. Got it. Answer my own question. Never mind. Awesome. I mean, I answered your own question. <laughs> That's honestly all there is to this carburetor. And it's really, and now I can take everything we just talked about for the most part, talk about every carburetor and every fuel injection system, and it really doesn't change by much.
So it's like, huh? I said sick. I yes. Know, what are you really good? Huh? Are there any changes then? The, the floats are always the same and the fuel meter is always the same, that kind of stuff? Mm hmm what changes the shape of it then? Shape of it. Like the Marvel Shebler, you can't take the top off and look at the fuel bowl because the floats are attached to the top. Uh, so if you take the top off, the floats come off and now you got an empty bowl. Well, how does that work? It's just it's just how you measure stuff is, is the only thing that really changes. Okay. So, let's see. Are those carburetors in the barrel? Yes. The only multi-barrel carburetors we have are pressure carburetors. And you can see the PR58 in there, which is this big, is a double barrel. Each one is like that. All right, let's see. Now we can write notes. Oh, man. You want to not write notes? Uh, I can see there's some stuff I didn't talk about. That's for sure. What's that? Oh, I was already where I wanted to be, right there. Okay. Just going to come down here. Go to that. And we're talking about float carburetor. The float carburetor. Which is actually 0.12, which is weird. Float carburetor. Well, what is its function? To carburate. A carburetor must carburate. Function. All right, this is long winded. A carburetor has only one function or one purpose. Wait, is it a purpose or a function now? And that is to deliver a fully atomized. Fuel at the correct air to fuel ratio to the engine under all operating conditions. Asterisk. It will not work upside down. <laughs> so, under almost all operating conditions. Normal operating conditions. Well, maybe it's normal for you to fly upside down, so. This is done by A, measuring how much air is entering the engine. Measuring how much air is entering the engine. B, measuring the correct amount of fuel for good combustion for the measured air or measured air and C delivering the mix of fuel air into the air moving into the induction system Delivering and mixing the fuel into the air moving in the induction system. The only purpose is to deliver a fully atomized fuel at the correct air fuel ratio to the engine under all operating conditions, sort of. This is done by measuring how much air enters the engine. What does the measuring? 
Venturi. Venturi. Uh, measuring the correct amount of fuel. What does the measuring of the fuel? Uh, not mouth. Metering jet. Metering jet. And delivering it into the air that is flowing up into the engine. Is it a break time? Yes, I'm talking for 50 minutes.